It was actually done by Margie. And some of her students that included both clinical psych and aging students and Jero students at that time, um, in the late 90s, um, applied a somewhat earlier set of criteria. And it reminded everybody that there was this literature, mostly from the 60s and 70s, on institutionalized older adults, um, showing that behavioral methods work really well with controlling problem behaviors in people with dementia. And in the intervening years, there been almost all the research that had been done like through the 80s was on um, cognitive behavior therapy of depression, and everybody almost got in the habit of thinking that like all the psychological interventions that we knew worked with older adults were about depression, and it's uh, kind of reawakened attention to, be, to behavioral methods for people with dementia. Um, and then just kind of coincidentally, it was timely because it was around the same time that the Institute of Medicine uh, started cracking down on, uh, or recommended a crackdown, which then the nursing home o oversight folks from what is now CMS uh, started implementing on physical and chemical restraints of people with dementia. So, the bad old days when I first got into Jero Psych and started uh, occasionally doing consults in nursing homes, if you had, had dementia, or maybe even if you didn't, and you had problem behaviors in a nursing home, you either got tied down to your wheelchair or you got so much held all you couldn't move. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> um, and um, so you either physical or chemical restraints were very common. And because because of the uh, crackdowns from what was originally hit by now CMS, um, it's less common than it used to be, you know, it's still not And you do see um, at least model programs, and some of the ideas have, have really kind of caught on around the country. It's, it's really kind of a list of things, uh, behavior problem solving therapies, um, ABC analysis is antecedent behavior consequence analysis. It just means that you identify what the target behavior is, and you say, so what was happening before that? And what was happening before that? And what was happening before that? And you try to get a sense of what, what's the sequence of events, behaviors, or environmental stimuli that seem to kick off the problem behavior? And at what point, and this is just kind of, you know, this is a problem solving part, at what point in that chain might it be possible to interrupt so that you could prevent the behavior from coming up? And then the other side is you know, the behavioral consequence. You know, what happens after the behavior that likely reinforces it? And, you know, the classic examples are you, know, you get people um, either behaviorally acting out or cursing loudly or screaming. And what happens is that everybody comes running. And so all, you know, just, just like with little kids, you know, you're unintentionally positively reinforcing the very behavior that you want to end, and it takes, although it's simple enough to say, um, it's pretty difficult for people to learn to positively reinforce quietness. A really good idea, and it works. It works on, on kids, too. It um, but but it, take, it takes a, a whole different mindset uh, to do that. Um, on the other side of things, it's kind of like you know, recognizing what the stimuli are for um, uh, problematic behaviors and seeing if there's something that you could do differently. We've been having some of these discussions on, on the Blackboard discussion in the last uh, couple of weeks. But for example, um, you're feeding, you're helping somebody with the feeding and so like in, taking food and you're sticking a spoon in their mouth and you whack your hand out of the way. That's a pretty clear sequence of events. You know, if you think about um, if somebody just stuck a spoon in your mouth, you probably whack it out of the way too. <laughs> yeah. What else might you do differently? Well, you, know, you might um, make sure they see the spoon coming. You might tell them the spoon is coming. If they're demented enough, you might want to remind them what's going on. And, you know, you might say, here I am, here to give you your lunch, and you know, we're going to sit down, and I'm going to take the spoon, and I'm going to put it in the plate. 
this is also it's also a good idea to check if the person actually needs you to do this stuff. Yeah, that was the other thing. Maybe yeah. they, they <laughs> feel like they, they want to do it themselves. More, but more often than frontline nursing home staff would want to admit, one of the reasons that you get whacked or yelled at is you're trying to do something for people that they don't need to have done for them. And so you're actually like kind of forcing a higher level of dependence and you're trying to get annoying for that reason. It's not always. The nursing home has to have a certain amount of flexibility in um, their policies in order for you to be able to do much about that. Some places actually, you know, it's part of the nursing home rules that everybody has to be assisted on the or Everybody with a certain room has to be able to do um, People have done things, you know, the kind of simple environmental modification level still coming out of the ABC analysis is uh, sometimes people have found that um, you can decrease people, you know, wandering out the front door of the nursing home by tending the glass so that people can't see as easily that life is more interesting outside the nursing home. This is you know, one of the reasons why people walk out. Is, you, know, you see something out there, you say, oh, it's nice. Um, or people are, you know, trying to go somewhere, you know, like, like Boston. You know. So they're going to leave the nursing home and walk back to Boston. If you, if you have a significant enough dementia, this seems like a perfectly plausible idea to you. Um, the best one was about Grandpa and the cookie. Yeah. I love That's an that. interesting one. this discussion. Uh, somebody was getting um, frustrated because um, Grandpa kept asking for cookies, and Grandpa was diabetic and demented. And um, the family kept saying, uh, Grandpa, you know you can't have a cookie. You've got diabetes. And Grandpa got upset. I think at least verbally abusive people about this. So uh, somebody in the family hit on the idea of keeping empty cookie wrappers around, and they said, oh, Grandpa, don't you remember? You just had a cookie. Oh, jeez. And Grandpa was like, oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> that's so cute. <laughs> so and he's OK with that. <laughs> um, another interesting trend in, in behavioral interventions with behavior problems and dementia is Linda Terry and Rebecca Logsdon and the group up at the University of Washington in Seattle have been working for a while on taking a cognitive behavioral intervention that was originally designed for intact people with depression. It's about now very commonly called behavioral activation, originally increasing cognitive events. And usually teaching caregivers, either family caregivers or uh, caregivers in nursing homes, to apply this to people with dementia who also have depression, because it actually turns out that a fair percentage of people with behavioral problems um, in nursing homes who, and family situations who have uh, dementia are acting out, at least in part, because they're depressed. And you alleviate the depression, um, you can reduce the, uh, the behavioral problems. Um, Individualized approaches to uh, lower stress levels on people. Individualized because um, one of the difficult things about dementia, like most functional disabilities, is getting the balance right between challenging people enough and, and challenging them too much. And so if you're trying to push people too hard, they're going to get frustrated and act out. If you make people's lives even more boring than they need to be otherwise. They get depressed and they might act out for those reasons. Or at least have excess disability. So you're finding kind of the right balance of stimulation versus excess stress uh, is another way to go. And various kinds of environmental modifications. Usually, again, rooted in behavior analysis. We were talking earlier about the tinning windows. Um, wandering gardens and such things, you know, have been for an early outgrowth of this. Um, and I guess that kind of, a big piece of uh, behavior analysis, applied behavior analysis, is also sorting out whose problem it actually is. And so you think, is the problem that the person with dementia is doing this thing, or is the problem that the people around them are upset that they're doing it? Like a common example I've run across over the years is um, um, some women taking care of their husbands who have dementia get really upset that the husband insists on wearing two or three shirts. And 
if they're willing to go for it, it turns out to be way easier to intervene with the wife and get her to be less upset about it.